As Christians, we know it's important to sing, but often we don't know what that looks like. We don't know how to start that process. What I want to communicate is not necessarily all of the tiny particulars of how to sing well and beautifully and with vigor, but more of the why and some of those things of, of the foundational steps to that that can hopefully encourage you and admonish you towards a better understanding and an execution of that process. I like to try to frame things for my students in in a way, first sort of from a, a of course, a biblical perspective. So I think as Christians, uh, first of all, it's important to know why we're singing. Um, that's something that when I work with groups, I always uh, start with is, why are we even here? Why are we doing this? And not just how to. So I think understanding what we're instructed to do in scripture and how we're instructed to do it uh, is important. We're instructed to, to play skillfully and to do all things as to the Lord. And so the cheerful countenance with which we're supposed to sing is actually the biggest thing that I emphasize to any groups or to my private students when I really start with them is I wanna make this process uh, accessible and joyful for all my students. So everything that I that I do beyond that starts there. So I think the again the first thing is is that cheerful countenance. And actually, there's a lot of uh, anatomy and physiology that gets affected by that perspective. That when we are open and we are cheerful, uh, literally in our faces there, all of the uh, mechanics of the singing start to go uh, much better <laughs> for, for everybody. So there, there's various elements to what we do. There's, there's the music reading, the music literacy. There's the uh, understanding of the, the style of what we're singing. There's then the mechanics of singing, uh, which then can be broken down into, you know, a, a lot of different subcategories. So um, the, the countenance from which we sing and that music literacy are what I want to start with today. So, so when, when we're approaching anything that we're doing with singing, we want to, be, we want to approach it from, as, as C.S. Lewis uh, writes in Screwtape Letters, where one of those, well, I forget which one it is off the top of my head, it's been years since I've read it, but um, that we're not just spiritual beings, we're very much physical beings. We were given these bodies, so we need to approach whatever we do with that knowledge and with that intention. And so we want to be open, literally open across the front of our bodies and have our faces up and have that open, cheerful, uh, uh, again, just that countenance. That countenance word is the thing I come back to over and over again. And then I think the second most important thing after that is, is really music literacy. And so if you're watching and you're somebody who is very experienced in music, you've taken lessons or you've been at a school, either uh, you know pre-college or in college or after, any sort of training you've had that has taught you to read music well or even proficiently at all, that's that most, second most important point. I always tell my, uh, my colleagues I would rather teach someone with a golden brain rather than a golden voice that I want somebody who who thinks well because then anything that I give them they're able to um, to really own and make and make personal to them and and work on it in a meaningful way so that music literacy I think is the is the second thing that we want to be uh, emphasizing with that especially for young kids you know if you're watching and you have kids or you might be someone that's younger um, learning to read music learning to listen to music is is way more important to me than necessarily the particular technical knowledge that you might have when you start to sing. So after we have that, that approach, we know why we're singing, and then we get the music literacy portion of it where we can look at a piece of music and go, okay, I have some idea of what's on this page and I can approach it uh, with knowledge there. Then the next portion of what I do is I start with breathing. Breathing is is any any uh, fairly competent voice teacher is probably going to start with that breath. So what I tell my students is not necessarily to 
try to feel anything in particular. We have a lot of different opinions about breath. There are, there are thousands and thousands of voice teachers and everybody's probably gonna explain that in a little bit different way. So the way that I have been doing it lately with all of my students is to, after we've approached our, our situation, our lesson, our time with music in this very cheerful, open way, um, I start and say, okay, so what I want you to do is to breathe like your body feels open and not trying to breathe all the way as full as you can all the time because then that just makes you stressed out. And if we're stressed out when we're singing, that's not gonna uh, you know, lead to any sort of good, sustainable, joyful process after that. So we just breathe open silent breath, real, real happy, like you're sort of sighing in <laughs> rather than sighing out. We have that big open breath. And so that again fits in with, I think, that joyful countenance that we try to talk about and that I try to talk about when I'm, when I'm at, um, at any particular uh, juncture with my students or with a group. When I come to New St. Andrews, um, I often work with the choirs and not just my private students. And so the first thing I, I get up in front of them, I try to show them what I want with that. I try to be open and joyful with how I'm approaching them. And so, and immediately the minute that, that they go from sort of downcast and, and maybe not fully engaged to open and their, you know, their countenance is up, that creates a way different sound. And it builds, it builds that Christian community as well because when they're all approaching it that same way, they're unified. So once we get through that, that open breath there, then we talk about how do we use it? How do we use it? So there's this sort of path of we approach it and then we take that in and then how do we use that breath? So I talk about a sigh. A sigh is a big thing that I love to, to because that's a very easy thing for people to feel. Everyone's probably done that. At some point we all have, have experienced, oh, <laughs> something, something to that effect. And so um, the way that I tell them to do it after we've sighed in that big, happy, open breath, then, oh, and then we sigh out. And then we can kind of change that and tweak that depending on what we want. But if we're going from that perspective, then a lot else is gonna go well. Everything after that is gonna go much better. So after that initial breath process, then the next thing that I do with somebody is to tell them, um, let's speak a little bit rather than maybe jumping straight into singing because not everybody might have experience with actual singing. So we speak through some things if I've given them peace or if we have uh, a hymn in front of us or something, something, some music that we've brought to that lesson time, um, we can speak through it. And so that kind of creates a bridge, I think, between between the very first steps of breathing in. And then this idea of singing to some people really is, is kind of frightening. I've looked into some of various, uh, various students' eyes and they look, they look really overwhelmed. And so, okay, can we, can we make this a little more uh, on their level and, and accessible to them with the experience that they already have? So we'll, we'll speak something. So if we're doing, the, the first thing that popped into my head as I'm, as I'm talking about this is maybe holy, holy, holy. So we'd speak, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And so we take that breath in, big open breath. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So we can, we can add some energy and a little bit of infusion of that breath that we took in to that sound. So my, my aim with all of this is always to make everything that I do with my students understandable. And so if at any point, and as you're watching this, or as you've had music instruction and you have questions, take a step back from it and ask, ask yourself that question or ask your instructor the question, hey, can you repeat that? Can we say that a different way? And these steps I feel like really add a lot of, um, it's an approachable quality. I think, to, to how we go about that. So if we've got that cheerful countenance, I think if we're Christians, we believe that that's true, that we need to come to our space with that. And then we get that breath in there. We start to feel something easy, something easy, something slow, something really tangible. And then if we can go from that, that perspective to that tangible feeling in the body, then everybody's spoken, that at least that I've, <laughs> that I've had in my, in my studio, we all, we all speak, we all talk to each other. So if we can use that something that's familiar to the students or to this particular student, whoever I'm working with or with a group, um, then we can really 
bridge the gap between the known and the unknown because sometimes it feels like that's a really large distance for a student where they know they know maybe what the Bible says about this and 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 we've all breathed you know but then making that in a way that that they can feel more specifically and then okay we've spoken so we're, we're doing these smaller steps towards singing so rather than going into all of the nitty gritty technical uh, ins and outs in, in this time here, uh, I just wanna give those tools that are able to maybe some things, maybe some whys and some hows on a really, uh, on a really fundamental level so that it doesn't end up being uh, overwhelming in the process because we don't need that. Uh, we don't need to try to take on too much. I have had students where we go through a lesson and they come back to me and they say, what what did you do to us? We notice everything we do wrong now. And so I don't, you know, and I say, well, sure, you know, we went through a lot of things, but, but how do you learn anything? You learn it one, you know, one small step at a time. So if we can go through that process and make that accessible. Um, so we've got that, that approach and then uh, again, the music literacy. And then once you're, once you're reading well, or if you have a really good ear, you can learn things by ear. Then we go into that, into that technique there. I think then the next step after kind of getting some of those very baseline fundamental things in is then learning that piece with those, with those very small steps. So we breathe that way in, open joyfully, then we sort of sigh out and maybe add a little bit of intention to that rather than just oh, letting it all out, maybe go, hmm, and we sort of sigh into a hum or we sigh into a little bit of a vowel sound somewhere. Something that adds a little bit of specificity to that first step there. Um, and then after we can get through that first stage of, of breath and very basic vocal sounds, then we speak that. And then we might go into learning the notes and the rhythms in really small chunks. And so we learn maybe two or three measures of, of, of that piece of music with that breath and then with that breath out. And then we sigh a little bit more intentionally. And then maybe we don't do it on the words. Maybe we use a vowel. Maybe we use a hum or something so that we can layer those things in, in a way that that builds what we, we love to use muscle memory in singing. That's one of, our, one of our favorite things because we're building habits, essentially. We're just building those habits so that when you go into a new piece of music or a new choir rehearsal or something like that, you have those habits built so you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. I think I told a group this past week, don't reinvent the wheel. You've already, you already have these tools, just apply them to everything you do. And then if you find a place where it doesn't work, then you can change it up. Then you can find something new to try to do with that. But, but do what you know with that. So after we've gone through that and then we learn that very slowly, then we can add those words. Then we can add maybe a little more context to that and some more components of the full picture of what we're doing. After we've started learning the music with those couple of fundamental foundational steps in smaller portions, then we can start to string that together. And before you know it, you've actually done a lot more work than you think. You've done the breath in work. Oh, wow. Then you've done the breath out work. Okay. And then you've spoken and then you've sung. And so there are so many more portions of this and so much more content in this process than people really realize. Often at the end of lessons, I'll recap, okay, so we've done the following things and my students get really excited because they think, oh, I really have done quite a lot of work here. We've done a lot of different steps and I've learned a lot about how my body works and I've learned maybe some new things about the music itself. So if we layer those things in slowly, I think that's, I think that's what I want to communicate most, most importantly today and, and drive home the point that it's, it's not necessarily about all of the individual tiny steps about what they are exactly, but taking those steps in the first place and learning how to be patient with that process. And I think as Christians, we are, we are well acquainted with being patient with things. We know, we know how to work hard over a long period of time but sometimes with something brand new. Singing is really, sadly, pretty foreign to a lot of people. They've, they've sung, you know, if we're, in, if we're in a CREC church, we've sung a lot of hymns and psalms, so we sing a lot in church, but they've never been instructed on what is that and how does that go and how is that supposed to go? And so if we can kind of 
uh, remove the veil and, and make it less cloudy for people to say, okay, you still take small steps with this. You don't just have to step into it and know it all. You can take that breath in, that breath out, a little bit of speech, a little bit of music. The, the thing I wanna drive home with all my students is because I've been doing this for, I've been singing and studying voice for 19 years and singing even before that. So I have made, uh, especially for my freshmen when I work with them, I said to them, I've been doing this specifically longer than you've even been alive. So I've made more weird sounds than you. Embrace those things, embrace that process. I go back to my fundamentals every single day. Every single day, I arrive at my office most of the time about an hour or so before my first lesson and I do different work and then I practice. I practice every single day in the morning, getting, you know, getting myself going and I return to those fundamentals and some days I do a little bit different of a routine, but most days I do all those, all those basic, basic foundational movements and breath work and that, that's the kind of work that is gonna produce a knowledgeable, sustainable process for anybody that wants to sing. Um, you don't have to know all of how every single bit of muscle and cartilage inside your throat works to do it in a really joyful, beautiful way. You just have to practice some faithful foundational concepts. So sort of coming into that end there, all of what I've said is stuff that I do, stuff that I know there that is it is steps and and principles that I know that are really important for a lifetime of of singing and a lifetime of hopefully being able to use your voice um, to the glory of God. And if we know the why behind what we're doing, behind how we are singing and 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 the process that we're going through, and then we use a few of those basic principles, the sky's the limit, really, because you will develop not just those good habits, but as we, we're all learning how, how to learn in classical education. That is one of the big aims of, of what we do. So I want my students to learn how to learn and to build some basic awareness um, exercises and be knowledgeable about their own process, even if that's a little bit of knowledge applied over a long time faithfully, they've learned how to learn. And so the students that I've had for, for longer periods of time learn more quickly the longer we go. I can give them something that's, that's more refined or a finer point of the, of the vocal technique and they pick it up really quickly, whereas at first we have to go through all those fundamentals for, for months and years. So they learn how to learn in that process too. So that's, that's I think, the, the cornerstone of what I teach and how I teach and what I want to communicate with all the information that I gave was, was and is, how can, I, how can I impart this knowledge in a way that helps you be joyful and knowledgeable and sustainable and teaches you how to learn? How can you learn how to learn well about your own body and your own voice? And take that hopefully to your children and your children's children. And to, um, if you, you know, of some people who are in positions in churches, weren't uh, in musical positions, weren't trained musically. So if you get put in a position like that, what can you take into that? And if it's just doing it at a very foundational level joyfully, then my, then I can retire. That's what I always tell my students. I want to teach myself out of a job. I want to teach my students to be so, such good learners and so independent that I eventually don't have to teach them anymore. And so I think these are the principles and those uh, pieces of those building blocks that are going to enable that to be the case over, over the long term.